Thank you for joining us for the premiere of Voices in Isolation, Pandemic and Protest. My name is Beth Johnson, Professor of Speech and Theater and Chair of the Visual and Performing Arts Department at Finger Lakes Community College. I'm here to welcome you to a very special opening night. As you can see, the theater is empty, but we have been hard at work collaborating remotely to present an original production. In late spring, the call went out to writers and composers for original monologues and songs that expressed individual experiences during this challenging time. What you are about to hear are the reflections of those individual voices, members of the community, students, alumni, faculty, staff, and retirees have taken this opportunity to bravely share their perspectives on this historic moment. The production culminates in a special performance, a multimedia collaboration between FLCC, Nazareth College, and Hobart and William Smith Colleges entitled Chance for Sound and Music. Immediately following the broadcast, please stay tuned for a live talkback session with the cast and creative team. You can email questions to the address below. Thank you again for joining us for the world premiere of Voices in Isolation. We see a world that is hurting. We feel the pain of so many souls. Yet in the sorrow of this time we live in, there is a light making us whole. It is the light of a million people giving the kindness and helping hands. There is a light shining in this darkness, so even apart, together people stand. There is a light. It started off as a joke, really. We sang about it in class. COVID-19 was nothing but a meme to us. Really and truly nothing but a meme to us, I swear. And then the rumors began. Whispers about being sent home and classes going online. There wasn't really any credit to them, though. No one really believed them. Then one day, 
We all went to classes and teachers began giving the talk. The college wants us to start making plans, they said, in case we have to go online. As we discussed last class, things are going to be different after spring break. But the semester will go on, and I, like all of your other instructors, will keep teaching. We just ask that you keep being the great students that you are. Since everybody said they wanted to keep meeting as a class, we'll do that. All you need to do is pay attention to my announcements on Blackboard, and I'll give you directions for meeting virtually. So we'll meet after spring break every Tuesday and Thursday from 11 to 1220, just like our class time is now. I was in the auditorium when it happened. My group on Snapchat, my roommates and mine, was blowing up. We were going home. It was official. I remember spending the rest of the day crying with my friends just breaking down. I remember continuing to cry the rest of the night when I got back to my dorm room. It looked like I wasn't going to be able to finish college. I was so mad. School was going beautiful until COVID-19 came and ruined everything. First, it started as a joke. I came into school thinking it was not that serious. Hi class. You may have heard that spring break has been extended by one week. It's true. I'll be in touch on Monday or Tuesday after the break with lots of options so that you can finish your semester successfully. Spring break is extended? I need my things. I lived on campus and a good half of my clothes, pillows, blankets, all of my schoolwork and books were there. After a month or so, I really missed my clothes. Spring break came and I got fired from my work because they said I had COVID, but I didn't. Pay attention to the invitation for our class meetings, Tuesday and Thursday, 11 to 1220. We're now using WebEx, a video sharing platform. I'm sure you'll be able to navigate it, since I have been. I've seen the news videos from people right from all states. At one point, I saw a video of a man collapsing because he had COVID-19. And that terrified me. What really made me scared was when I heard that the virus made us move to Rochester. Live office hours today, class. We can do this. Lately, I've been out of energy, but I don't feel like giving up. There was a lot of false involvement and activity going on. And my friend went to class for three days and never came back and said it was a fraud. Try it. You'll like it. That line is from an old TV commercial for Life Serial. Everybody knew it at the time. In this case, however, I'm talking about WebEx, the video platform we're using to meet as a class for the rest of the semester. The whole world was thrown into chaos, and the first thing to go was the toilet paper. Everyone shut themselves inside their houses, except for people who needed groceries, people who thought that the virus was made up of some sort of government conspiracy, and those of us who had jobs that were deemed essential. Myself? Well, I was working at a gas station, because when I thought about the apocalypse, I always imagined being at work. I guess some people still need their coffee and donuts, even while people are dying around them. I've spoken to a couple of you this morning, which was great. Remember, class starts at 11. If it gets to be 11.15 and you can't connect, just email or call me and we'll get it straightened out. Thanks. Online classes don't agree with me. I'm neurodivergent, enough mental issues to choke a horse and severe ADHD, I can't sit still, I, I, I can't pay attention. I struggle with reading on a good day. So how the hell am I supposed to do online classes? We're all going through such a difficult time, I understand. But completing this course will help you deal with what's on the horizon, your future. With COVID-19, I hope the best for people because I personally see what it does to people in the side. I'm in my live office hours now. We can talk about the class or about anything else that's on your mind. Everything at home is toxic. How am I supposed to focus on learning with all of the yelling, with the insults? What's the point in asking for help if there's nothing anyone can really do? We're all living in these times. I'll show up. That's all I can do, sitting on the couch that masquerades at night as my bed. I miss my dorm room and 
the collection of things I had gathered that I was able to call mine. They said we could go back. Where are my things? Where is my life? Hi class. I've streamlined the requirements for you to earn a passing grade. By doing this, you'll get credit for the class, allowing you to move forward with your educational goals. If you receive a C- minus or higher, you can take that grade or choose a satisfactory grade. I ended up having to withdraw from three classes, and I had to fight for my federal aid back. It's not too late for you to pass this class and move forward with your academic goals. Here we are. With luck, you'll see me returning in the fall. And until then, you can find me selling coffee and candy to people who won't wear a mask, even with hundreds dying around them, to cops who have the gall to smile at me when they walk in, and to people who support one of those things, but it's not the right one. Overall, I really hope people take this serious. I'm really worried about my family. I'm not too concerned with school, which is not good in any way. I'm looking forward to this virus being destroyed and everyone going back to their normal lives. I care, and I'm here for you. This whole thing happened really fast. One day I was in school and the next day we had to stay at home because of this virus that came from China. It spread all around the world and my parents say that there's no cure for it and a lot of people have died from it. Now we're all in quarantine, which means we stay at home and away from each other. I really don't like quarantine. It's, it's not fun when you can't go anywhere. There's a lot to do at home, but for me, there's just so many choices. I don't know what to do. So sometimes I just do nothing. And since they closed school for the rest of the year, now we have to learn from home. I don't like it. I like school and for me, it's easier to concentrate in school rather than doing everything at home on a Chromebook. I miss my teacher. And I'm upset that I can't see any of my friends. I can only text and FaceTime my best friend, but it's not the same. I was in fifth grade and now I'm missing out on my last year in elementary school. I'm missing the end of the year picnic, saying goodbye to all my teachers, field trips, visiting the middle school and my last father daughter dance. As much as I don't want to miss out on all these things, it's okay if it means less people get sick and die. That's why I don't understand why people don't seem to care. We're supposed to stay at home as much as possible. And if we do go out, we're supposed to wear face masks to protect each other. Sometimes my dad has to take us to Walmart, but we stay in the car while they put groceries in our trunk. While we're waiting, I see people going in and out of the store with no face masks on. They aren't being careful. Maybe they don't care or they aren't afraid, but they aren't thinking about everyone else. How come I can miss out on things I'll never get back in order to keep everyone safe, but other people can't do something as simple as wearing a mask? I wish coronavirus was never a thing. Before this virus thing blew up in March, I was a happy horticulture student, just hanging out in the greenhouse and walking around campus identifying trees. After 35 years at a desk job, it was like a blast of freedom. Then in flies COVID-19, worse than a spring ice storm. All classes online. Are you kidding me? I came back to school to hold the earth in my hands. I watch it on a monitor. This is where I should say I'm lucky. And it's true. I had lots of advantages. 
I could stay at home, I have money saved, I have great internet and lots of space. And I have a lot of quiet, maybe too much since Mark died. But still, I was a total grouch those first few weeks. Once I finally figured out that I should schedule some time out every day, I felt a lot better. And in April, I tackled this yard. I pruned bushes, yanked out weeds. I even pulled out these monster saplings with my truck. And then by the middle of May, I had the spinach, the lettuce, the peas all planted. And then at the end of May, class is finally done. I came into this shed looking for a small rake to clear out the raspberries and I came upon this little bird bath. It was all dusty. My friend had given it to me a while ago, my friend Bonnie, because she knew that I was really stressed out after my husband's diagnosis. I was all work, work, work. Watch some birds with your husband, she said. I've always loved gardening. I never had time to look at birds. I rinsed off the bird bath and set it next to the shed where the hose is. I do know enough about birds to know that I'd have to change the water a lot. So I filled up the water and then I came back in a couple of days and no poop, so no birds, and the water was down just a little bit, so I filled it all fresh. And then, I don't know, I got distracted by something. I think my daughter called, so I dropped everything. And when I came back to put the hose away, I noticed the strangest thing. Not a bird, but a leggy wasp. Now, usually when I see a wasp, I get out of the way because I know its nest is nearby and it's on the offensive and I don't want to get stung. But this was totally different. The wasp had no interest in me. It was almost like I was watching it on TV. It flew down and kind of hovered, and then it landed on the side of the bird bath, dipped its head, and then sipped, and then lifted its head up again, dipped its head back down again, drank some more water, and then it lifted its body up, its long legs dangling, and then it landed down again and drank some more. It almost reminded me of those plastic drinking bird toys, but it was much more elegant. More like a ballerina just kind of lifting and landing. Who knew a wasp drank water like that? This pandemic has been really hard, but there have been moments like that when I've noticed things that I never took the time to see. My name is Jim, and I'm a TV holic. If that's a thing. If not, it is now. I live alone, so I watch a lot of TV. I love watching TV. TV is my go-to recreational activity. And with the onset of the quarantine, I've been able to exercise this hobby even more. I want to be clear. I don't consider this an addiction. I am a connoisseur. And I'm not a fan of that stuff they put out now. I think procedurals are boring, and I don't watch reality shows. That's right. I could care less what talent America's got or what color bikini Kendall Jenner is wearing this week. I love the old shows from when I was a kid. Shows from a simpler time. I actually thought watching those shows would be therapeutic. Like going back and being nostalgic would be a good way to get away from all this weirdness and help me decompress a little. But as I went from show to show, I started to realize just how many episodes from the 70s and 80s used a pandemic as a plot line. MASH, MacGyver, even Magnum P.I. All had stories with some type of quarantine. These were episodes I clearly remembered, but when I'd watched them before, I must have glossed over the idea of the epidemic. 
Well, these stories certainly took on a very different meaning this time. Let me tell you, watching them made Jim very uncomfortable. Uncomfortable like watching Chuck Norris try to do a love scene in Walker, Texas Ranger uncomfortable. You know what I mean? Beyond that, I found myself analyzing the behavior of the characters in the shows. I was very critical of the lack of masks and social distancing. Watching MASH, all I could think was, why didn't Hawkeye wash his hands after examining that patient? He's a surgeon. He should know better. And while we're at it, how could he be drinking before doing rounds? And then came all the science fiction shows. Buck Rogers, Battlestar Galactica, and of course, all the Star Treks. Star Trek used the idea of an epidemic multiple times in each of its many series. Do you have any idea how many shows that is? Trust me, it's a lot. I mean, you could put all the pandemic episodes together in one box set and call it the episodes that went viral. You could binge watch that set for weeks. And you know what the kicker is? In every one of those episodes, the doctors discovered the virus, analyzed it, developed a vaccine, tested it on themselves, and cured the crew. All within the course of an hour. An hour. Take out the commercial breaks and it was like 42 minutes. Seriously? I started daydreaming about the possibility of Dr. McCoy curing COVID-19. And then I thought to myself, damn it, Jim, he's an actor, not a doctor. That's when I realized that these shows weren't providing me with what I was looking for at all. I'd been hoping to escape from the real world for a while and hide in a land of make-believe. But the make-believe I found hit way too close to home. I was having more anxiety than George Lucas watching the Star Wars Holiday Special. From that point on, I decided to stick to pure escapism. Something that had no foot in our present reality. Something like Gilligan's Island. Yes, that simple story of seven castaways shipwrecked on a tropical island. A skipper, a first mate, a millionaire, his wife, a movie star, a farm girl, and a professor. A professor. A scientist. A scientist who on more than one occasion cured an epidemic using a couple of vines and a coconut. Is there no God? Happy birthday, Sophie. I'm so sad I won't get to see you today for... Sophie, the big number five. Soon you'll be off to kindergarten. Daddy's going to set up Skype tonight so I can watch you blow out your candles from the hospital. I can't believe I'm going to miss your fifth birthday. <sighs> okay. Keep it together. Good morning, birthday girl. I wanted to leave you this message before I head off to the ward. It's going to be a long shift, so I won't be back before you go to bed. I got the drawing you slid under the door last night. Is this you and Daddy cooking in the kitchen? Thank you for taking care of Daddy. You're such a big girl. 
I can't wait till we can eat together as a family again. I'm so tired of hospital food and takeout. Sophie, I know that it's hard to be separated in our own house this way, but this is what we have to do to keep you and daddy safe right now. As soon as this sickness is gone, I'm gonna throw that door open and kiss you a thousand times. Okay, here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear soul. Happy birthday to you. There's a meme floating around out there with three friends, all identical. The drawing is of an artist alone painting in his easel. The first friend says, artist before pandemic. The second friend says, artist during pandemic. And the third friend says, artist after pandemic. The implication, of course, is that as an artist, my life is supposed to be unaffected by all this. Wrong! There's this idea that artists are strange little creatures who don't fit in with the rest of the world, and so they continue just not fitting in during this difficult and horrific time in our history. There's an idea that artists need to suffer in order to create, and so, hey, this should be the perfect time for our creativity to soar. Pain begets beauty, right? The more pain, the more inspiration. The more inspiration, the more work. The more work, the more beauty. It does sound like perfection, doesn't it? And for the first week or two of isolation, I thought the same thing. I'll get up every morning the way I used to before art became a business for me. I'll create things I never created before, step out of my comfort zone, and really soar. But you know what happened? None of that. Life went on. I taught my classes completely online. I organized my studio so that it was neat and clean. In preparation for the massive influx of creative ideas coming my way. Yeah, no, because of the suffering. Most artists I know are just people. They're not carried out of a graphic weeping into the arms of some unknown and forgiving and supportive partner. They don't escape to a shed in the woods, a loft in Soho, or a pond at Walden to do their work. And every artist I know has both ears. We're people. People who worry about their kids and get angry in traffic when they hear through the grapevine that Walmart got a new shipment of toilet paper in. We're people who wait for inspiration with bated breath, and when it doesn't come, we just paint anyway. We don't wear smocks. French berets and smoke French cigarettes. We're people doing our work just like you.
wrong for not wanting this to end, for enjoying New York on pause, don't get me wrong. I get that people are out of work and can't pay rent. I get that supply chains are breaking down and that soon we may all be vegetarians. I get that people have kids and that online schooling isn't for everyone. I get it all. But I like being home. I like being socially distanced. I like the loss of most deadlines and the fact that I get to be in my default position, home. And I don't mind the masks. And I don't mind the lack of traffic. And I don't mind the fact that dog walkers seem genuinely glad to see me when I sit on the porch and say hello as they pass by a safe distance away. I am an introvert. There, I said it. Out loud! And I'm not going to apologize for it anymore. For so long, I've been teased for being shy or quiet. I've been bullied into attending social events I wasn't interested in. Gone to parties because it was expected of me, even if I'd rather bring a book and find a quiet corner then try and keep a conversation going with someone I'd never see again. Sometimes I really envy those Regency heroines who are allowed to retreat to the library during a ball. So yeah, this whole quarantine thing, I'm more than okay with it. This is my perfect world. Hey buddy, sorry I didn't answer the phone at all the last couple days. I'm really, really, really sorry. I'm not mad at you, so please don't think that. It's been a bit hectic here and I couldn't bring myself to talk to anyone. So here's a note. Yeah, here's a note. So the other morning, I woke up at 6 a.m. to my father sobbing because of his tooth. The one I keep telling you about that needs to be removed. No oral surgeon was willing to see him because they didn't have the right equipment to do any procedures right now. Our regular dentist put him on a painkiller a couple days ago. Why can't I just say this out loud on the phone to her? The painkillers our dentist gave him affected him so much that the other morning he was completely incoherent. And we had to call 911 because my mom and I thought he might be having a stroke. Well... He thought he was dying. Maybe I should tell her that? Mom and I had already decided that he was not going to the hospital unless he was literally going to die. But we knew that wasn't the case. The ambulance came and only two of the 11 people came into the house, even though none of us had left in the past three weeks. It was understandable, but... We didn't know what to do, and we needed help. Thankfully, it was just the painkillers reacting poorly in his body, and he pretty much had a massive panic attack, which, combined with the tooth pain, just sent his brains off the chart, I guess. You know Dad is undoubtedly a grouchy man at times, but Maddie, seeing him in that much physical and emotional pain was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Calling the ambulance for your parents is something no one ever wants to have to do. He's okay now, and thankfully Dr. Smith is an amazing woman. She somehow found an oral surgeon to get his broken tooth out, so we don't have to worry too much about him. Or me, for that matter. We're still crazy as always, but we're doing fine. So that's why I haven't picked up your calls or responded to anything. I really am... So sorry, but I know you'll understand. I just thought of something else before I finish writing this out. Something the EMT said really stuck with me, and I thought you'd get something out of it too. He said, 
Times right now are shitty, no doubt about it. But the only way through this is together. Anyways, <laughs> I'm really sorry again. But I still love you, and you're still my best friend. Call me after you read this. I'm better, so I promise I'll pick up this time. I just needed to write this out to you instead of saying it on the phone. Keep your head up, and I have the biggest hug waiting for you once this is done. In 1938 or 1933, depending on how you define created, Joe Siegel created Superman. To keep the series fresh and alive, he introduced new elements every six months or so, adding to the mythology surrounding the character. After guiding Superman through the 40s and 50s, times of enormous change in the world, Siegel decided to throw in the notion of a completely contrary universe, called Bizarro World, circa 1963. In this world, every norm of the Earth was turned upside down and inside out. The legion of stupor heroes fought for evil. Batman's counterpart, Batzaro, deemed the world's worst detective, sported a futility belt filled with cigarette butts. Garbage men delivered trash to homes, and of course, scientists shot rockets into the ground. Tragically, sometime in 1986, the hideous sorcerer, Mr. McZiptic, causes Bizarro World to implode, never to be heard from again except in Earth parodies of SNL and Seinfeld. For a while here on Earth, despite our usual wars, terrorist attacks, and a modicum of civil unrest, an unspoken acceptance of racial inequality, things are humming along pretty well. There was even talk that there was a black president. Then, in 2016, a comet strikes the Earth, and weird changes begin to ooze into and then out of the once thought of almost extinct cottage cheese-looking underbelly of the American society. It was a subtle slime, but a slime nonetheless. At first, there were feeble efforts to contain it. Then, quite literally, acts, small and large, of Congress to impede it. Nothing could stop it, really. And just when people responsible for its rise started getting a bit queasy, it morphed into Bizarro World 2. This was then exacerbated by a multiplication ray that came in the form of COVID-19, a weird, politically neutral scourge similar but not quite like the typhoid or the Black Plague. The MP ray itself was undeftly wielded by an earthly reincarnation of Mr. McZiptic in the guise of an American president during the second most famous Ides of March 2020. This new Mr. McZiptic too tripped early and often and misfired, setting off a chain reaction that was ultimately the dawning of the first bizarro spring. Almost immediately, renowned doctors became villains, scientists with PhDs, and years of experience in grinding out the scientific method were found to be liars and conspiratists of the worst sort. Policemen committed crimes, and even healthy, educated people went to parties to get sick. There was one time, on one particular day, when a governor sued a mayor over wearing masks while wearing a mask. Journalists throughout the land remarked that this second coming of Bizarro World would have made the harsh, wizened old Bizarro One leader weep with tears of contemptible glee. Um, me not so unhappy, he'd say. As the cycle seemed perpetual, earthlings became hopeless. Then, the cycle became more perpetual. Overlooking the fact that they had paid close attention to DC Comics No. 97, September 1986, or The Wizard of Oz, they would know that Bizarro One, through Mr. McZiptic, destroys himself and his planet. But, of course, not before he unsaves his own son by rocketing him off into another planet with a collapsing core. In the end, a vaccine and the definitive oyster of Mr. McZiptic II may be a better solution for the Earth's people who presently carry the onus of dual citizenship in two worlds.
Remember when you were in high school and you learned about Rome? It was this incredible empire. They took over the known world and ruled for 500 years. Everyone thought it would last forever. But it didn't. They were overthrown by groups of barbarians, beaten by tribes of uneducated people with no training. How could that possibly happen? It happened because the barbarians didn't cause the fall. They merely took advantage of the opportunity the Romans gave them. You see, the Roman Empire rotted from the inside out. The government forgot what its purpose was. Instead of serving the nation, the leaders became corrupt and served themselves. You know, you have to wonder if the people living then could see it happening. Were they aware that things were falling apart? Did they notice? Or did they just assume it was part of the ups and downs of living? I mean, did they joke about it after coming home from a long day's work? Tough day at the office, Ignorantis? Well, everyone is arguing about religion. The poor have their panties in a twist about the li their living conditions. The gulls are bitching about discrimination. And now there's some Antonine plague that is going to come and wipe us all out. <sighs> Same shit, different day. Hey, is dinner ready yet? They're sacrificing Christians tonight, and I don't want to miss it. You know, I think we're the Romans now. I mean, when you look at how our government has been handling the pandemic, you have to wonder, don't you? Instead of listening to and serving the people, our leaders are pointing fingers and arguing and throwing tantrums like petulant children. Hundreds of thousands of people are dying. How does our leadership respond? By ignoring the advice of experts, undermining anyone trying to save lives, and firing anyone who attempts to help, and then claiming, eh, could have been worse. Our nurses and doctors don't have the supplies they need to help people. Does our commander-in-chief prioritize that need? Oh, no. He's too busy having a pissing match with, with Twitter, because they questioned one of his posts. Oh, not to worry, though. The president has assured us that we're all going to be fine, and that this is all just a hoax. No one is really dying. It's all just fake news. This is all like a bad copy sketch. I watch it and I think, okay, now everyone will have to see that we as a nation are in big trouble. That we are on a runaway train with no one at the controls. <sighs> yeah, not so much. Apparently there is always someone willing to drink the Kool-Aid. Or, in this case, the bleach. And we all know how well that worked out for the Romans. How are the lion feedings, dear? Not like the good old days, but the emperor himself was there. Oh man, that kid can really play the fiddle. Cue the violin music. really? Well, simple answer would be that I'm still here, for the most part. But honestly, nothing feels right. Not right now, at least. The world is in disarray, and being a witness makes it no better. But, but that's, that's not really how I am. I am catatonic frozen in time, left alone with my thoughts for so long that I'm crippled. <laughs> Solitude wasn't meant for me. My menacing thoughts made sure of that. <sighs> the virus isn't my biggest enemy. I am my biggest enemy. The self-deprecating thoughts 
are my biggest enemy. How am I supposed to be? Everything I need is out there while I'm stuck in here with everything I don't want. The mean voices in my head heightening fear is already being aggravated by the world. How am I supposed to make it through this? Fighting so hard to not let depression be my Achilles heel this time, only to be failing miserably? <laughs> I won't make it. Not this time and definitely not alone. Send help. Send anything because I'm stuck. <laughs> Mentally, I'm where I was when this started. I I hate it here. Here, I'm no one. Here, I'm exactly who my demons expect me to be. A vessel for them to parade around in ruin. I'll be in ruins when this ends. <laughs> when it's over, they'll leave again. And I'll be left to piece me back together alone. Again. I know this is for the best, to save my life, but if I make it, I won't feel saved. I won't feel anything because I'll still be stuck inside. Inside a mental void, I have no idea how I escaped before. Where's the map that leads me out of this? Out of isolation. Isolating my physical self? from my mental self is painstaking work, but I did that to be able to survive this. <laughs> now, how do I piece me back together? <coughs> can't, be can't breathe. It's been days. I can't breathe. Been sick for so long. I can't breathe. Stuck in bed. Uh, I can't move. <coughs> At home. Now here. I will. I hate hospitals. Don't trust doctors. Spent my whole life trying to get away from them. <coughs> now I can't probably won't leave. I can't. Mama, I can't. Mama went first. Got here a week later. She lasted nine days on the vent. <coughs> How long do you think I can last? Mama, I can't breathe. Maybe I got it from her. Or at work. Please. <coughs> Doorman. I speak to so many people. Everyone. I can't breathe. I'm afraid. I can't. What if? Please. What if I gave it to her? Mama, I love you. I can't do nothing. I couldn't live with myself. I can't breathe. Please. Please, please tell my family. I can't breathe. <coughs> I love them. I can't. Is it time? I cannot. Okay, it's time. They gas at them babies just like they did us. Throwing them down, kicking them, arresting and sicking dogs on them, just like they did us. I, I tell you, 73 years under God's eyes, and the only thing that has changed, the only thing that seemed to waver, is that we found a better remedy to get the blood up out of our clothes. I remember when we used to throw our dresses away because the stains were so rich before we started wearing all black. Maybe it's something in the water that's changed. Oh, I notice the trees growing taller, making it harder to hang, folks. Black body repellent? My Lord. 
And I feel guilty. Like I, we failed these babies. We handed them a curse and a blessing at the same time without teaching them to smile on the account of God's promises. I reckon it was passed down to me like it was passed down to my mama. I can still hear the licks and horrible screams from when I marched with King and prayed with Malcolm. And it's not only in my memory, it's on that there TV screen too. I want to spiral and speed up these civil bones and hold a line and plant my soul on solid ground. I want to fight. And I ain't mad. I ain't pissed. I ain't even tired. I'm black. A Negro, a woman, a mother. Grandmother rocking hard and steady praying for these babies because they gassing them just like they did us. Some days, some days I feel like I'm, like I'm 17. I feel young and angry, but closer to freedom. I feel like I'm watching my friends be murdered all over again. Every single time. It's the same. Every single time. They hate and we allow it. They discriminate and we allow it. They murder and we allow it. We allow it every damn time and it only perpetuates the cycle of hatred. Growing worse and worse every generation until the way our society functions banks on the hatred and on the bigotry. We allow it until we don't, until we stop and we think and we see that maybe, just maybe, we shouldn't be treating other human beings this way. So we speak up, please stop hating these people, please stop killing these people, please stop harassing these people. We ask for basic human decency. And we're the bad guys? Because somehow it's easy for you to ignore because of your privilege. Because you've never experienced discrimination. You didn't grow up watching television and seeing very few people who look like you. To have a love, a fear of love, so ingrained in you that you'd rather be dead than be yourself. To know that no one has your back because friends are hard to come by and the police and the whole damn system are built to keep you down. How is that easy for you? So we plead, desperate. No one listens. Those who are capable take to the streets. They make signs and chant and demand change. Remember, the first pride was a riot led by a trans woman of color. The pleas turned to orders. Stop now, change now, kindness now. The shouts cannot be heard any louder National coverage, local protests, big protests, signs on the streets and signs in store windows, and still, 
No one listens. How do you scream and beg louder than at the top of your lungs and from the bottom of your heart? Actions speak louder than words, so when they don't listen to our words, we must take action. We can't change history. We can only change the future. This isn't over. Do not stop fighting. Hi, everybody. This is Kristen Shiner McGuire from the Rita Collective and Nazareth College School of Music. Chance for Sound and Movement is a multimedia composition initially conceived as a tribute to the creative collaborations of John Cage and Merce Cunningham. In the summer of 2020, Steve Green had an intuition for a new piece generated by chance procedures and improvisation characterized by reflective ambience and lots of silence. Steve began a series of discussions with David McGuire about how such a piece might be realized. Very early on, it became clear they were imagining an ensemble from which emerged the possibility of a multimedia ensemble. Choreographer Donna Davenport joined the project in the late summer and with this, the piece began to evolve towards its current form. The sound of chants is derived from a basic pitch set of five notes from which a number of short motives are designed or improvised. In the piano part, the I Ching is also involved in shaping the order of these gestures so that no two performances are the same. The movement of chants is derived from a list of choreographic parameters chosen in advance by the dancers to be realized as they will. The dancers, students of Davenport's Dance Composition Seminar are arranged as a number of small ensembles whose members perform individual interpretations of the elements they have chosen, but also come together once in unison movement. The choreography also references the sound and vice versa with the inclusion of stillness. The visual range of chants is consummated by lighting designer Mark Wenderlich and videographer Matthew Thomas, whose skill imbues this recording with a resonance of a live performance. Chance is about the cultivation of attention and grace as we search for balance in the face of the unpredictable.
Thank mm-hmm. you. 
I don't know if you want to turn your camera on. And when I see us come up on the YouTube, make sure your YouTube is muted so you don't get an echo. And we're live. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. And I want to take a special moment to thank all these wonderful people that are with me tonight as part of the talk back. We have some questions already, but if you have questions that you want to send in, you can send them to the email, which is the voices.in.isolation at flcc.edu or the chat as well. We have people monitoring the chat on YouTube. So I'm going to start, I think, with, because the audience might not be aware of this, but this is the first time that these people got to see the final cuts of the work they did, um, except for perhaps the, the very last number. They might have gotten to preview the Chance um, musical collaboration, but for all of these people, this was a first viewing for them as it was a, a premiere for the audience too. So just in general, particularly as musicians, writers, actors, did what you see tonight alter your perception of the work we had done before, what we did in rehearsals or what you had read before? Um, were there any th revelations or reinterpretations of the work? Go ahead, Cindy. Unmuting. Hi, everybody. First of all, I'd like to say to Jules, thank you. You did an absolutely wonderful job with the piece that I wrote. Um, I, I it was wonderful to watch to to see your work, see the, the words that I wrote uh, come to life, and and I thought Jules that you did a great job doing it. So thank you for that, and. Uh, to the rest of the cast, you also did wonderful jobs as well, but it was really very special to hear what I had written, given life. Thanks. Any other writers get a new take on their work based on what they heard? Or I'm gonna pick on Barb because Barb wrote and performed her piece, um, but didn't see sort of the the cut with the edits in there. Any, I mean, definitely we worked together on the piece throughout and it kind of changed from draft to draft, but then in the edit, any revelation? Well, it was wonderful seeing the lilac bush and the still shot to the bird bath uh, because, you know, flat on, you just saw the bird bath next to me, but to see that shot from above, I thought it it really helped. And the wasp, I loved the wasp. Um, it was just really exciting to see it. It was a fabulous job. And then having Jim's piece come after with him inside of the TV, that was great. <laughs> How about oh, one, one more thing, when we first the first time I read this uh, for Jim and for Beth, it really read like an essay. 
and the feedback that they gave me um, that time helped me to go back and revise. And then I met a few more times online with Beth and, uh, you know, just the suggestions that you gave and practicing it and trying to make it not an essay because it's not an essay, it's a monologue. Um, really helped me a lot. So it was a really wonderful experience and I'm very grateful that I got to participate. Yeah, we kind of have two sets of people here, right? We have writers that perform their own work, which gives you a little bit more control. And then we have writers that had someone else perform their work, which is, you know, where you don't have any control. And we have our youngest writer, Lainey. So I don't know if Lainey um, wants to share sort of her reaction to watching somebody, you know, who is not your age perform that um, or anybody else who had their work performed by somebody else. I think that everyone did a really good job and I really liked how even mine was performed. And I think it was really cool to see all of the different performers and all the different writers doing something because this, it's a challenging time. And I think it's fun to see the different people with different feelings on it. Thank you. So uh, the piece that probably had the biggest change was the keep teaching piece, which Maureen and Gail and Buddha was here a while ago. Um, I hope that Buddha comes back. The three of them worked together on it. They worked in Google. Um, they had to shoot a lot of things on their own and try to submit it. And it was uh, maybe, I don't know, Jim, you can speak to, it was, was it possibly the most challenging of the pieces to work on? What was, um, Gail and Maureen, what were your reactions to seeing the Keep Teaching? Well, I just thought it was so effective to see the students' um, points of view interspersed with mine. And I thought that um, seeing Buddha in New York City where he filmed some of his pieces, um, it just gave that just such a great contrast. But seeing the real, hearing the actors um, put so much emotion into it, you know, the stuff that students are and were and are go, really going through versus the teacher who's like cheerleader and trying to keep it all together. I just thought all the contrast with those three was great. And Jim and Jeff did an awesome job putting it all together. I think from my end of it, it was really neat. Like I remember reading, like seeing it through the first time, um, with like the edit, edited together, the three of them. And the way it inter intermingled was really cool. Um, and obviously all the editing was exceptional. And a lot of like, we can read the lines, but all of the legwork comes from Beth splicing it together. And everyone who was working on the editing, like that's where like all the real magic happens um, with a scene like that. Um, so thank you to all the people who went into making that as awesome as it was. Um, Cause all I did was sit there in front of the camera and read these lines, um, most of them. Some of them went to Julia and Julia did a wonderful job with what she was given saying she was sort of given it like the day of. Um, so she, she was wonderful and everyone was wonderful. And I'm really happy with how that one came out because it was just different than most of them. Thank you. Um, Let's talk to the musicians for a moment. I'm sorry, Jim, I saw a finger. Did you want to say something? Well, I'll just comment on what you asked. And then there is a question in the YouTube chat if you want to go to that at some point. So you let me know. But that particular piece in, in this larger show that was all collaborative as well, that piece was the most collaborative in some ways because Jeff and I were working on it. Beth was directing and inputting. Footage was arriving all the time and things would have to be reshot and different people would shoot different takes from different angles. We added Julia in at the 11th hour and it continued to morph right up until the last minute and became something, I think a lot different than what it started as, but it still had the same, it, it achieved the same goal that I think you were looking for. So that one was kind of interesting to watch from where we were, a little bit stressful too, but because it was all coming in so late. So. And you let me know when you want the question from YouTube. Yeah, I saw that question. That was actually similar to one that um, came in um, earlier. But we'll start with the one from um, YouTube. Go, if you want to go ahead and 
uh, read that one. That'd be sure. great. The question is for people who have never performed in front of a camera, did you have to get used to the camera being right there? Yes, definitely. Um, I've only ever done things on stage. So working on focusing on one single point and a very small point at that was very difficult to get used to, especially in a short amount of time. I had to figure out how to unmute. Um, I also um, wanted to say yes, um, because um, I was originally um, actually given a different piece and then um, I ended up working on just my own piece because of time and um, some other stuff. But um, when we were staging it with the cameras, um, Beth and Jim really had to work with us and say, no, you gotta put the camera here, you gotta put the camera here. And it was a whole new learning experience um, kind of, because you know, with acting, you can kind of, everyone sees you from the angle and you know what angle they're seeing you from, but then you have to think about the lighting and the different camera angles and um, what they can and can't see. And so it was, um, it was a very fun experience though. Um, to see um, what came out with everything um, and how we work together. A couple of the actors, uh, Jason and Daniel, got to film in our studio on campus in the TV studio. Um, I wondered if either of you had any reactions to what that experience was. I um, have performed in front of a camera a few times. So that wasn't as sort of stressful as I had a teleprompter and that was right in front of the camera. So I was just looking at all of these words and the camera was behind it. And I just had to output the information as soon as I was inputting it. And it was, it was a very new experience kind of learning how to, uh, say something as I'm reading it. Hmm. How about you, Jason? Um, it was definitely definitely an experience. I've never been in a studio like that before with uh, all the cameras. Uh, it felt very professional. Um, and I had a great job with the project and I'll be willing to do it again. Thank you so much. Uh, let's shift over. Oh, go ahead, Daniel, were you waving? No, okay. I'm getting a few uh, texts on my phone of people asking how to ask questions. If you wanna remind people how to do that again. Sure. So you can email questions to the Voices in Isolation email, um, or you can put them in the YouTube chat. So if you're watching this on YouTube, which presumably you are, you should be able to put those in on the chat there. Hopefully that will help that. So I wanted to talk to um, Tom and we have four people here that were part of the collaboration at the end and slightly, you know, different projects. And I wish Christian was here because Christian is a music student at FLCC who wrote a lot of the interlude music that played in between and did an amazing job at creating these, you know, nice mood, you know, soundscape transitions for us that we got to use and really, really helped um, fill things out for us. But so Tom, could you maybe talk about this song that you created? How did you come to it? Was it something you had before or something that you created for this in particular? Oh, thank you, Beth. First of all, I'm very, very uh, pleased to be working with such a fine bunch of people. This has been really wonderful. Um, sometimes uh, music inspiration comes to me at the strangest times of day. I don't know if that's something that others of you have experienced, but this one started at 5 a.m. on an April morning, and I woke up with the refrain already playing in my head. So like I have learned to do, don't try to go back to sleep, get up and start writing. So that's how that, that germinated, so to speak. Thanks. So this is something that you did before, right? And then when you saw the call for music, you had this already? Or did you see the call and then this came? I. I don't remember exactly. I think it was around the same time. I think I had started it. Uh, I don't remember when the call was, but this song was begun. I wrote down April 29th. I don't remember when you first sent out the call. 
I think it was kind of kismet. I think that was <laughs> generally in that same realm. So thank you so much for sending it because it was a great way to kind of get us started. It's um, been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So we have um, Kristen and Dave and Steve and Donna that are here representing three different colleges. And you had this amazing multimedia piece at the end. And there was a lovely introduction to it that explained the, the concept. But I'm kind of curious as to how everybody was able to work remotely, both across campuses, but in the studio. I mean, can you give us some insight into how you guys worked? For me, it was um, particularly wonderful because the initial idea involved chance and putting things together without having any idea of how they're going to look when they are finally put together. And that's how Cage and Cunningham often worked. So um, I think we got the idea a little bit before we heard about the call for Voices in Isolation, but it, it seemed like a perfect fit. And I've worked with Donna before and she's brilliant and I've worked with Steve before and he's great to work with. So um, it was a, a really good opportunity to do something creative because like, you know, so many of the, you know, vignettes referred to, you can feel very isolated and just like sort of, you know, just hanging in midair and cut off from everything. And so all of a sudden we weren't cut off from everything. And um, Donna was great working out all the, you know, particular protocols for making it possible to get even a small number of bodies in the room at the same time. But um, I had not seen, you know, the beautiful movements that the dance students came up with before we were there. And I had not played the music with the other two musicians before we actually played it. And it was different both times that we played it. So um, it was really fun. And, you know, if there can be sort of a tailor-made exercise for this kind of a situation, you know, just the way the design of the piece worked seemed to work very well for the situation. Yeah. I think the, uh, there was one thing that was the uh, initial um, instructions that I came up with was make something that has more silence than sound yeah. and more stillness than movement. So those, with that, everybody kind of went off into their corner and started working off of that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of cool, and especially when Donna brought in the lighting, uh, the lighting designer and everything. Yes, yeah, yeah, Mark did a great job. Yeah, so you let, let people be at their creative best. Yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to add, especially because I, I'm a choreographer that I did not um, act as a choreographer in this, this production. This was actually an exam. And one of the, the wonderful things, the silver linings of the pandemic is that creative people solve problems, right? So I wanted my students to have a live performance as, as an exam in the composition course. And so when Steve and, and Dave and I were talking, it all, it all just came, came together. So I came up with a movement score in much the same way that David came up with a sound score and then um, the students actually they choreographed their their 10 minutes and Steve essentially gave me the the challenge of working with stillness and um, so there was a lot of stillness um, and that whole idea of voices in isolation came as Dave said afterwards and it was just perfect fit I mean everything it's like the universe was uh, in sync with with us as artists, and um, that's a strange paradox, and it's horrible, horrible mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Well, I really appreciated it. Um, a because it was a wonderful finale, and the the boxes on the floor. Because when I was laying out for my theater movement class, right, I created these boxes on the floor to keep people socially distanced, and I yep. really liked, you know, the four corners where the musicians were and the people in the boxes with the masks. And I thought it was a kind of a visual representation of a lot of the things that the writers wrote about. Um, so it was a, yeah, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. I want to circle back now and give some of the actors that didn't get a chance to talk already the opportunity. Um, this question came in about sort of, you know, what new insights do you 
um, have as an actor now after going through this process. So I'm gonna pick on some people that haven't talked yet like Arthur and Henry. First to unmute goes. I can unmute you. <laughs> no one. Anybody else want to jump in on, you know, what insights you have as an actor now? I had a conversation, not really a conversation, an interaction with my dad before the show. And um, he asked if like the stage nerves were setting in. And I was like, no, not really. Because it was weird. Like, I'm so used to just being like jittery and anxious, but like feeling like on top of the world right before the curtain opens. And I recorded these pieces. And after I record a piece, I'm always, no matter how good I actually do, I always feel like I could do better. So it was like this anticipation of waiting for these premiere to see if I actually did good watching it and not just from the perspective of being on the other side. Um, and so it's a really weird experience to not have only what you, to have that time after the fact before it premieres to think about it instead of just getting that like live feedback of, oh, no, don't worry, like that was fine. Like it didn't, it wasn't as bad as you thought it was versus waiting and waiting and waiting and then no nerves like it's, i was just sitting there and i just clicked on the link to youtube and i was like this is fine and that's unusual yeah i found myself very like i'm a normally very anxious person and before this premiered i just felt nothing but excitement to watch all of it come together because I had only seen the takes that I had done and sent in because it, it was just me. It was by myself or with Beth recording them. And then, so I didn't get to see anybody else's. So when it all comes together, you just, you didn't, like, I didn't know what was going to happen and how things were going to look. So it was just a whole new, a whole new thing to like for me. There it goes. Okay, I was having trouble. It would not let me unmute. Um, I see a question that came in in the chat about how did you select your pieces for the show? And another question that was emailed about how did the sort of the vision, original vision change, right, as the project went along. Um, I will say that we used pretty much everything that came in. There were a couple that came in maybe too late to be in the process, but we used essentially what came in because um, I wanted the show to be as inclusive and po as possible, not just in terms of people could participate in it from anywhere, but that we included as many voices as we possibly could. Um, Jim, do you want to start and maybe talk about from your perspective how the project might have shifted as we went through um, and then I could talk about it as well? Well, it, it took on a life of its own in the sense that as people submitted work and the work was, of course, when you put out a call, you expect a certain type of thing because you have a concept in mind of what you want to do with the show. But then because you have all these individuals with original ideas of their own and these things come in, it the, the, the project morphs over time and it actually takes on a life of its own and it grows by all the people who are involved in it, which is kind of a really interesting aspect to this type of production and Julia was mentioning even that you know she had only seen her own takes and when you work in a vacuum it's very interesting it, it can be it can be rewarding but it can also be very eye-opening when you see other things so again when the concept started I think the show started in one direction mainly for these voices that were isolated in quarantine but as the situation over the months changed and as people started to submit work, the, the project changed laterally in a lot of ways. I don't know if that answers it. Yeah, and for me, when you know, I was first thinking about this in the beginning, I was like, 
all right, we have no idea what the fall is going to look like. Because I knew in March, right, that things were not going to be the same in one way, shape, or another. So when Jim and I talked, we were like, all right, possibly we'll have a reduced audience in the auditorium, but some people won't want to come in. So we need to be able to broadcast it, right? Because we have to broadcast, we can't use a lot of licensed material because there were not at that point, publishing houses weren't thinking about live streaming. And so there wasn't a way to get rights to things to stream at that point. That has changed in the last couple of months for sure. So I guess for me, the biggest shift was the, the narrowing of the focus once we knew that this is gonna have to be basically all remote because of just how things progress through the summer. Um, but in like, the concept as a whole, I think, kind of stayed and held fast. But of course, we had no idea what people were going to submit. So it's been a, it was a risky process. It was an exciting process. Um, but I'm glad that it, that all of you got to participate and that it came out the way that it did, which brings me to a question that I have to you as writers. Again, I'm going to come back to the writers. The call went out in the spring and now is in the fall. If you had to write something now, right, about our life in the quarantine, life, you know, Black Lives Matter, post election, I mean, would it change the way your piece is or no? And feel free to jump in. I guess the question is what would you write now if you wrote something? I feel like if I were to be asked to write something again, it would read almost the same way. I feel like there obviously like I could have edited what I had um, if we had like a bunch more time to work on it than we actually had. Um, but at least my pieces, like my uh, quarantine piece was very personal. And so they're and like reflective back on something that already happened. So it's not much, it wouldn't change with what's happening now necessarily because those things still happened. I mean, that was still how I felt. Um, maybe I just had more experiences than I did by the time I submitted it. Like I talked about, I didn't know what the fall was gonna look like because I wasn't here yet. Um, and the protest piece just remains super relevant, I think. Um, it's a, it's not calling out a specific protest. It's just a call to act, action. So I think it holds up even as like the consistency of these protests go up and down. Awesome. Cindy, I saw you on mute. Sure. The, the piece that I wrote really reflected where I was. It's, it's a slice of life uh, at, at that particular moment in time. And uh, although it reflects pretty much my attitude throughout most of New York on pause, which was, I'm okay with this. Um, as it has continued, it's been surprising to find to see how my own ups and downs have been. And the fact that, you know, here we are now, eight months later. So, uh, and I think if I wrote another piece now, it would simply reflect the, the length of time. Um, and the fact that in some ways, I'm still very much okay with this. And in other ways, I'm chafing at the bit. Um, it, it really just kind of, as things have moved on, certain things have, have been, have remained. I, well, I'll be honest with you. I've read more books this year than I think I've read in any year before. Um, because it's, it's been an, I, it was wonderful that you put Julie with the, the, uh, with the book, because that was, that's been my year. Uh, and I think if I wrote something now, it probably would reflect that piece and the fact that I have been able to escape, as it were, into these other worlds. And what Jim wrote, did with the escaping into the TV was pretty much what I've been doing, escaping into my into the books. So I think that if I were to write it now, it would reflect more of that. But there's a lot of it that would remain the same. Okay, thank you. Jim or Lainey, I'm looking through the faces to see. And we have Maureen and Barb too, and Tom. Yeah, I'd love to hear uh, Tom's um, 
playlist now as the song keeps going on. Who wants to jump in first? I'll go ahead. Okay. Um, it, it, it seems to me that this, what, this whole production is like a snapshot of all the good that is happening that we need to notice more. There's so much uproar in the news about the bad stuff that's happening, but there it really is so much good that's going on with, again, like I said, this is a snapshot of that sort of thing. Uh, people working together, not alone or working together while they are alone. It, somehow it's happening in so many beautiful ways. Now I would say, uh, continue my friends to lead with love and never give up. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Jim or Lainey? Sure. Um, I think that something that I would write differently is something good because a lot of my piece was focusing on most of the negative stuff. And I think that now that I've done more of online school, I think that maybe I would write something about being more creative with online and school and everything like that. Nice, that's a good perspective. Anybody else writer wise? How about our, oh, go ahead, Barb. I think the, the piece that I wrote is a particular voice at a particular time. And I don't know that I would change that that much, but over the summer, um, I did a lot of uh, voter registrations and I also participated in some monitoring of all of the abs those long lines of the absentee, or not the absentee, but the people that voted ahead of time, you know, those that stretch of time we had before election day. And it was such a powerful experience to see people managing COVID and also managing to get out the vote. I think I would write a piece about that because it was a really exciting thing to, to be a part of. Gail. Yeah. Kind of bouncing off that a little bit. If I were to, like thinking about like election day and how it lasted like a week. Um, if there was one thing I would want to like include like joke wise, because all these, a lot of these pieces were really heavy. And I know you talked at least to me about that quite a bit, how a lot of pieces were really, really heavy. And so where we could find any levity, we needed to use it. Um, I feel like if I could now having already had months more of experiences, I saw this one joke on Tumblr between when I wrote that and now that said how quarantine like this year and how the, the flow of time is gone like we have no concept of time anymore um and it was like january february march 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 april may june july august and then like september october kind of slowed down a little bit then you get to november 1st november 2nd november 3rd november 3rd part two november 3rd part three november and um, I would love to incl have included that joke because whether or not you were, uh, you, whether or not you're a political person or sitting on the edge of your seat waiting for election results or not, that flow of time, I feel like. Um, obviously the separation from society and social distancing and all that, but that idea of like just losing this whole year, I don't know what happened to it, it's gone. But that would be, I think a good joke for have one of us to have included. I would have if I could rewrite it. Awesome. Go ahead, Jim. I just want to say there's a lot of very kind comments in the chat, and I'm not going to go through through them, but I wanted to thank the people who commented. But one struck me, which was it was interesting how the randomness of elements became so cohesive. And I thought the same thing as I was watching it tonight. You know, we're in the box. Jeff and I and Beth are in the box because we're literally. We're at, yes, literally. I think I'm, I'm Mrs. Brady. Um, we, we don't get to see it that way. Then when, you, when I sat back and watched it tonight, it all fit together because we're all in the same situation, just differently. So it worked out that way. I wonder how it's going to be to reacclimate when things 
tend to go back to normal. It'll be interesting because I think we've all gotten used to this in some sense. We've all adapted. Even if you think you haven't adapted, you've adapted in some way. The, right, the, the fact that you were able to write or perform in this shows that. So it'll be interesting to see how this progresses forward. And maybe we revisit, you know, with each other, if, if nothing else, toward the end of this and see how everybody felt. But I thought it was an interesting comment. Beth, did I see your hand? Sorry, Bethan. Have it. <laughs> Um, well, I was just going to say, um, it's crazy that um, because we went into this semester, I, this is my second year at FLCC, and we went into this um, before COVID and everything, thinking, oh, we're going to do a musical. This is going to be great. Main stage production in the fall. We're going to do a musical. And then COVID hit. And when Beth, when she first announced that we were doing this show, I was kind of bummed. And I was like, but I wanted to do a musical. Why are we doing this? And I didn't, you know, it, it didn't really sink in that COVID was going to be this impactful and um, we were going to be in this situation on say November 19th. Um, but I also think that it, it's been such a crazy experience because I, um, I mean, I wrote my piece when we were halfway through, um, you know, we maybe a month ago, we finalized everything. I sent in my stuff kind of late, sorry, Jim. Um, <laughs> but, um, I also think it's cool because like my aunt who lives down in North Carolina has been texting me because she was able to watch this. And I think that this was wonderful because if we had done a main stage production, um, of a musical, my aunt down in North Carolina would not be watching our musical right now. And I think that, um, even though there are negatives in, um, you know, with all this and it's such a different way of, um, seeing things I wouldn't have written. I wouldn't have performed in this way. I would have never met. I've, this is the first time I'm seeing some of these faces tonight on Zoom. Um, and, you know, well, thank you all for um, helping us with this. And it's just crazy that we never would have gotten this experience if um, this bad thing hadn't happened. And I just thought that was really cool to share. Thank you. What about my collaboration team um, from Chances? Any plans, any thoughts about what might come next? Well, one of the things that occurred to me when I was listening to people talk, I mean, these moments in some ways are, I mean, unprecedented or puzzling or even excruciating, but I think we're going to have a hard time or we will be hesitant to relinquish them. We're um, being shown things about ourselves that are very rich, um, if painful and difficult, or maybe not painful and difficult. I mean, like just adjective of choice, but we're going to be thinking about this for a long time. It'll make a difference. And um I'm not sure what else to say about that, but it's it's a really strange, rich, odd time. I mean, the way history often is. And future plans, Donna has, and Steve have talked about doing this again sometime, resurrecting this piece and having it be something different. So um, I'll let them chime in. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the piece is actually 20 minutes long because yeah. the score uh, it's actually 10 minutes. And so what you all saw was just a little, a little excerpt. Um, we put a four minutes with, with four minutes and just so that it wasn't a too long. So I've actually seen as of a few hours, the whole thing. So I think Steve has some ideas. He's sort of our, our producer. Um, I worked as a writer actually of the score and, um, I was not, not a performer, but I, I, felt it live and I it was actually a highlight of my whole my whole semester oh, um, it was extraordinary extraordinary live and um, you know it just uh, yeah it was it was just amazing so I'm am definitely interested in whatever Steve is <laughs> thinking about um, but I think it would be for the whole thing which is is probably around 22 minutes long you yeah. know I think we're going to, um, in Rochester, through the Little Theater, we're going to, um, we're going to stream it. And Donna has talked about potentially somewhere down the road of redoing the piece and um, with some of the dancers that she knows, and, um, which is kind of nice about the piece is that it can be replicated yeah. in different ways. So um, 
we're accepting all grants. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add that I really, really appreciated hearing and seeing everything. Uh, I yeah. I'm, I'm grateful to be invited and um, yes. I worked in the theater all, all my life. So um, really, really moving, moving monologues and um, just really, really grateful to be a part of this. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank yeah. you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. It is wonderful that the colleges were able to collaborate um, with one another in this way. And again, that's something that may or may not have happened, right? If right. we had been in a different situation. That's right. All right, just a little bit more and then we'll be done. But I have a couple people that have been so quiet. I really wanna give you the opportunity, Henry, Arthur, Jason, maybe to, to add in, you know, uh, maybe it's, you know, what's it like to perform without a live audience? Cause that's a really, you know, acting into the void a little bit. I mean, what was, what was this like? You know, how is this different from other things you've done? Anything that you want to share? Go ahead, Henry. Well, for me, I mean, this, this is like my, my second show online completely that I've done. I mean, the, the first show that I did, I actually um, provided my, my voice. So this was the first online show for me that the people actually got to see not only my well, hear my own, not only my voice, but also got to see me in person. So that was something added on from the last show that I did. And Henry's an <laughs> alumni. He's gotten two degrees from FLCC. So he was a theater alumni. And then what was your other degree? I apologize, I forgot. Oh, my, my other degree was in teaching assistants. Awesome, awesome. Jason or Arthur? I had never done an online show, so this was entirely a new thing for me. In fact, I had never uh, performed before a camera. And I'm so used to performing live that I usually, you know, like having that connection between me and the audience. I can, you know, when I tell what is obviously supposed to be a joke in the script and hear what the audience, you know, you know, reacts. If they don't react at all, so that way I know, okay, this audience doesn't like this kind of humor. Or if they just die laughing I know okay they like this I probably should do something like that here is kind of difficult and it's also since I was working mostly with myself and the most contact they had with you know uh, Beth and Jim was through emails and all that fun stuff and it, it wasn't that instant kind of you know hard to describe but just kind of like instant like you know we work it out like in the moment but instead we kind of worked out over a period of time. And so, you know, for a few recordings, I was, you know, doing my own thing and like, you know, which I think totally, if I remember correctly, like I decline was different. It was a lot more like, you know, serious. The character was a lot more, more like a, for lack of a better word, a jackass, you know, this, you know, kind of pompously dis you know, describing the situation to some someone he saw as like, you know, very much not as smart as him and, you know, in a sarcastic manner. And so Beth was like, okay, you know, you, know, you got it. It works, but like, try doing it like as if, you know, you were doing your best to explain it to them in a like somewhat nice manner. And I felt like that after doing that, it worked a lot better than like what I did before, which was quite nice. Yeah, the feedback loop was definitely delayed, right? Because you sometimes they sent a take in and we looked at it and then we had to give them feedback and then they have to say, you know, or maybe like with Julia, I was on Zoom while she was recording so I could kind of watch what she was doing and give her feedback and we could do a number of takes. So we learned to do like everybody, right? We've all learned how to do things in a different way and from growing to the grocery store to working to whatever it is. Um, Jason or Daniel, anything you guys wanna add? And then I think we'll wrap up and I really appreciate everybody's participation, viewers and participants on the panel. Um, I've did stuff like this before, you know, with small skits with friends. Um, as far as an audience, I'd rather it not be an audience because as an actor, you try to focus more on the audience and trying to impress them. Um, and, you know, you risk not being able to get the lines out, right? And so you have to redo it again in front of people. I'd rather just do it in front of a camera and, you know, do the editing. 
feel like without an audience, it made it easier. Okay, thank you. All right, if nobody else, I'm gonna give the, the mom pause here and wait to see if anybody else wants to say anything, but otherwise I'm gonna thank the audience so much. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for watching and participating. I have to give a huge thank you to, oh, Steve just jumped in. I'm Steve Dupre, uh, one of the writers, is <laughs> joining us at the last moment. Um, I really have to thank Jeff Kidd and Jim Perry for helping make this happen. It would not have happened without them in any way, shape or form. And of course, with each of the writers, each of the actors and performers, you guys really contributed your voices, both on tape and you know through the words, thank you, thank you. And the music was such a wonderful plus. If anybody sees Christian, please give him a thank you. Um, Steve, I don't know if you got to see your piece or not, but thank you for joining us. <laughs> You're muted but thank you for sending your piece in. No, I just got out of a rehearsal and I thought I'd pop in and see if you guys were still chatting. Yes, we're still chatting, but we're just wrapping up. That's what so, I figured. <laughs> good night, everybody. You know, we'll be able to come back and watch the show on the channel. The music department thank will you. be uploading video yes. of recitals very soon. And so we'll have lots of stuff. So please subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already. Thank you. Have a wonderful night. Okay, bye-bye.